Since taking over management of the Beatles, Brian Epstein had his sights set further afield from shows in the clubs of Liverpool. He wanted the group to perform in more reputable ballrooms and theaters, to appear on television and radio, and to secure a recording contract. On the 10th of January, 1962, he visited the BBC's Manchester headquarters to complete a three-page application for an audition by the Variety Department. The hope was that he could get the Beatles an audition before radio producers, who would then call on them to perform on their shows. Epstein's application was approved, and the Beatles traveled to the BBC, Piccadilly, Manchester, to play before Peter Pilbeam, a producer for radio shows aimed at teenagers, made in the northwest of England, but broadcast throughout the nation. The Beatles played four songs, Like Dreamers Do, Till There Was You, Memphis, Tennessee, and Hello Little Girl. The first two were sung by Paul McCartney, with John Lennon taking vocals on the latter two. On the 7th of March in 1962, the Beatles recorded their radio debut at the Playhouse Theatre, Home, Manchester. The recording was for the show Teenager's Turn, Here We Go. The band rehearsed their set from 3.45 p.m. in the evening, wearing suits for the very first time. The Beatles performed three cover versions, Dream Baby, How Long Must I Dream, Memphis, Tennessee, and Please Mr. Postman. Together with the other three acts also appearing on the program, the recording took place between 8 and 8.45 p.m. On the 10th of April, Stuart Sutcliffe, ex-Beatles bass guitarist in their early period, died of a brain hemorrhage. He'd been suffering from increasingly severe headaches and blackouts since settling in Hamburg with Astrid Kircher, his German fiancée. The cause of these remained uncertain, though Sutcliffe believed they were a consequence of overwork. On April 11th, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Pete Best flew out of Manchester destined for Germany for their first residency at the Star Club in Hamburg. George Harrison was unwell at the time, so he flew to Germany the following day with the Beatles manager Brian Epstein. Lennon, McCartney, and Best were met at the airport in Hamburg by Astrid Kircher to tell them the devastating news. June 6 was the date of the Beatles' first visit to EMI Studios at 3 Abbey Road, St. John's Wood, London. The session took place in Studio 2 from 7 to 10 p.m. The Beatles first ran through several songs and then recorded four. Precise numbers of takes are unknown, but they were taped in the following order. Besame Mucho, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, and Ask Me Why. August 15th was Pete Best's final show with the Beatles. This was the Beatles' 91st evening show at the Cavern Club. It was also the 38th occasion on which they performed both lunchtime and evening shows at the venue. More significantly, it was Pete Best's final show with the Beatles, two years and three days after he first performed with them. The Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, asked Best to come to the NEMS office the following day, although the drummer failed to see anything unusual in the request. Uh, sort of clash of personalities. The boys, the Beatles, yeah, well, they've been over here several times. Mm. and. To me, they seem to have a say in everything that happens, I would have ima imagined. I don't know them that well. Well, uh, I think they've always been like that, not just since Brian's taken them over. They've always been like that. They've always sort of had a little bit to say. But um, from the point of um, clash of personalities, well, probably that may be it, because it, Peter was uh, did have a terrific fan club, you know, yeah. compared to the others. It's too Though, good looking, perhaps, eh? Well, I'll leave that for the other people to say, but from my point of view, we haven't come here to sort of um, throw any st sticks and stones at the boys because there is no really hard feeling. There was at first, but as I say, success mm. is hard to come by and these things do happen. But it's just the way that it was done that has annoyed us, mm. that's all. If it had done, been done a bit more straightforward, it would have been more to the mark. I've forgotten about it now, you know, I don't know what they are. Yeah. But uh, the way I look at it, you know, just let it lie now. Except right. for the reports in the papers, and they, you know, it gets me a bit niggled at times. They keep, keep going and having a go at you, do they? Yeah, you know. Well, what, do, what do they say mainly? Well, you know, the drummer wasn't too good, the beat wasn't so hot, you know. Was... How'd you get on with Ringo? Did you talk to Ringo? Well, I haven't seen Ringo for donkey's years. I used to be good mates of his. 
mm. you know, before the replacement took place. We're still mates now, like, but mm. I haven't seen him to have a chat with him or anything like that. Pete Best was probably the best looking of the bunch. He was very quiet with a sullen kind of charm. Pete initially in Liverpool was the most popular member of the Beatles, particularly with the girl fans. And whenever the Beatles used to appear, all the girls used to shout and scream for Pete. But he couldn't play drums very well. I mean, couldn't keep in time too well. And I was aware that the band weren't tight. They, they needed that sort of binding force that a good drummer should give them. So I said to Brian, well, I'll get another drummer for the recording sessions. You can do what you like with, with him on stage. But we'll have someone else on, on, on the tracks. And I didn't realize until afterwards that they'd been thinking the same thing anyway. Following the sacking of Pete Best, the Beatles were quick to recruit their new drummer. Ringo Starr wasn't a stranger to the band, having stood in for them on several occasions in Hamburg and Liverpool, where he primarily played for Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Ringo first played on the same bill as the Beatles on the 13th of March in 1959, on the opening night of the Morgue Skiffle Cellar in Liverpool. He was playing with Al Caldwell's Texans, and further down the bill were the Quarrymen, Caldwell later became Rory Storm. The Quarrymen, of course, were to become the Beatles. I think one of the biggest changes I do remember from the Beatles was when, um, when Pete Best was given the sack. Um, we were actually um, invited along to see uh, Brian Epstein at the time. He'd just signed uh, the Mezzabit up, so we went along to the office. And Pete Best was walking out of the office as we were going in with a very long face. We said hello to him, he completely ignored us and walked past. And we found out later that um, Brian had said to him, I'm afraid uh, we'll bring a new drummer in, we'll bring a Ringo Starr in. But if you want to stay in the business, uh, I suggest that you join the Mersey Beats. Well, he turned that down by saying, they're not gonna join those little kids. <laughs> but we, uh, as it happened, we wouldn't have had Pete anyway because we were quite happy with John Banks, who was our drummer at the time quite happy but I did notice a great change in the band then um, and after that we went along we appeared with them at the cavern uh, the next day and I remember uh, they were doing a lunchtime session and as they turned up George had been assaulted outside they should to do the first show with Ringo Starr and George came in with a big black eye and we said what's happened to you and he said they're all taking it out on me he said they're trying to take it out on John because he'll flatten them so they've all picked on me they've all punched me he said it's my fault for for throwing Pete Best out, because Pete Best had such a legion of fans. He was possibly the most uh, popular at the very early days, because um, he was so good looking and so handsome and uh, very quiet, and he had all the girls screaming for him at the time. Uh, but I think the sound changed as soon as Ringo joined the band. To me, it was slightly different. He did a different bass drum pattern. Um, Pete was a lot more, a lot simpler, uh, a lot of heavier player. And uh, to me, they went more to an all-round band than the heavy rock and roll as they started off with. I mean, as it happened, they, they went from strength to strength then. But, um, but I think the sound somehow wasn't quite the same. I remember one event where, where it sort of changed and I realised the Beatles were going to make it. I mean, from day one, I knew they were going to make it. I just knew they were going to do something. I didn't know how big they were going to be, but I, I knew they were going to be big, not just around Liverpool, not just around Merseyside. One of the, the, uh, the first reasons for me saying that is um, I remember them coming back from Ringo joined them by then, and they'd been to record, and it was the follow-up to, to uh, Love Me Do, it was Please Please Me, and they changed it quite a bit. They, they wrote it initially as a Roy Orbison type of song, you know, like uh, Last night I said these words to my girl, one of those, you know. <laughs> and they came back with a new interpretation of it, faster, Paul singing a, a top melody over John, and George coming in with Paul doing the backing vocals. And it just blew me away, and I remember getting shivers down. They were playing it live, the new version of it, live on the cavern, around the corner from here. And I just said, oh my God, that's it, that's the one. That's gonna be number one all over the world. And for, to make a bold statement like that, which I did to myself and to friends as well, when I, as a 15-year-old boy, um, was, something, was something else. 
you know, but I realised then that they were going to do it. It was just, the, the way they changed it, um, it was just an immediate number one record. On Thursday, August 23rd, John Lennon marries Cynthia Powell at the Mount Pleasant Register office in Liverpool. Brian Epstein was the best man, and George Harrison and Paul McCartney were also in attendance. Absent was John's aunt Mimi, who disapproved of the union, although Cynthia's half-brother and his wife were there. Tuesday, September 4th, the Beatles record How Do You Do It and Love Me Do. Following the Beatles' first session for EMI on the 6th of June, 1962, they returned for a second attempt at recording their debut single. This was Ringo Starr's first recording session with the group. In the morning, the group had flown down from Liverpool Airport. They checked into a hotel in Chelsea and arrived at Abbey Road shortly after midday. Before the recording session, the Beatles undertook a rehearsal overseen by EMI's Ron Richards, during which they repeatedly ran through six songs. Two of these, Love Me Do and How Do You Do It, were chosen to be recorded by the group. The rehearsal lasted between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. During it, they also played a slower, bluesy version of Please Please Me, which featured George Harrison playing the main motif throughout the song. On September 11th, following their studio session of September 4th, the Beatles recorded How Do You Do It and Love Me Do. EMI hastily arranged for them to return to London for a third attempt to complete their debut single. The session, which lasted from 5 p.m. to 6.45 p.m., was produced by Ron Richards, although George Martin arrived halfway through. Ringo Starr was relegated to playing the Maracas on a remake of P.S. I Love You and Tambourine on Love Me Do. George Martin was concerned with the quality of Ringo Starr's drumming on the original Love Me Do, and so arranged for an experienced session drummer, Andy White, to play on the session. White was paid a standard fee of five pounds, 15 pence. Brian Epstein walked into my office one day and said he got a group that he wanted me to hear. Brian had apparently taken one of his tapes into the EMI store in Oxford Street to get it transferred to disc. And the engineer heard it and thought it was very good. Brian told him how he'd been to every record company in the country and uh, hadn't got any, anywhere with it. And he saw me because I had a reputation at that time for being rather screwball and, and uh, rebellious and uh, I would take any nutty thing like the Beatles. The music wasn't frightfully original. There were no great songs there. It was just the sound was interesting. I arranged a, a recording test with them in Abbey Road number three studio, which meant I was gonna spend a couple of hours with them finding out what they could do. They had a very, very funny version of Please Please Me, which was rather slow. They did have Love Me Do. Um, weird things like that swallowed your feet's too big or Till There Was You. I got them to sing lots of different things to find out which voice was good. I was looking for the Cliff Richard or the Elvis Presley or the Tommy Steele, saying, now, is Paul going to be the main one or is John going to be the main one? And George, well, he's obviously not got such a good voice as the other two. And then it suddenly hit me right between the eyes. Why the hell should I find the solo singer? Why not just have a lot of them as they are? It wasn't their music that sold them to me. It was their charm. They were very charming people. On Monday, the 1st of October, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and their manager, Brian Epstein, signed their first and only contract as the Beatles with this lineup. It replaced an earlier contract that had been signed by the group's previous drummer, Pete Best. Ringo Starr signed the contract under his real name, Richard Starkey, and the fathers of George Harrison and Paul McCartney also signed the contract, as the pair were under 21 and needed parental consent. Under the terms of the contract, Epstein agreed to undertake all necessary advertising and publicity for the artists, and to advise the artists on all matters concerning clothes, makeup, and the presentation and construction of the artist's acts in return for 25% of the group's earnings, as long as they made more than 200 pounds per week each. The Beatles and Epstein signed the contract at Epstein's office at NEMS in Whitechapel, Liverpool, four days before the release of their first single, Love Me Do. The signing was witnessed by Epstein's secretary, Beryl Adams. The contract was sold at auction in London in 2008 for 240,000 pounds. 
and again in 2015 for 265,000 pounds. That's $553,121. I hadn't had anything to do with uh, pop management, management of pop artists before uh, that day that I went down to the Cavern Club and heard the Beatles playing. And um, this was quite a new world, really, for me. Uh, I was amazed by this sort of dark, smoky, dank atmosphere, this beat music playing away. And um, the Beatles were then just four lads on that rather dimly lit stage, uh, somewhat ill-clad, and the presentation was well, left a little to be desired as far as I was concerned, because I've been interested in the theatre and acting a long time. But amongst all that, something tremendous came over, and uh, I was immediately struck by their, their, their music, their beat, and uh, their sense of humour, actually, on stage. And even afterwards, when I met them, I was struck again by their personal charm. And uh, it was there that, really, it all started. It took about eight months to um, get to the stage where we had a recording contract and we were having um, the first record issued. And uh, from there to the present, well, where their last record sold half a million copies within ten days of issue. Actually, their first record did very well. It sold a hundred thousand copies. That was Love Me Do. The best thing was it came to the charts in two days. And everybody thought it was a fiddle because our managers, stores, send in these, what is it, record things, returns, returns. and everybody down south thought, ah, oh, ah, oh, he's buying them himself, or he's just filling the charge, you know, but he wasn't. Actually, we've been at it a long time before that. We've been to Hamburg, I think that's where we um, found our star, we developed our star, because of this fellow there, he used to say, you've got to make a show for the, the people. I used to come up every night shouting, Mac Show. So we used to Mac Show, and John used to dance around like a gorilla, and we'd all, you know, knock our heads together and things like that. Anyway, we got back to Liverpool, and all the groups that were doing this sort of shadows type of stuff. And uh, we came back, leather jackets and jeans and funny hair, Macking Xiao, which went down quite well. We just bought leather jackets, not as a, not as, not for the group. One person bought one, I can't remember, and then we all liked them, so it ended up we were all on stage with them. We'd always worn jeans because we didn't have anything else at the time, yeah. And then we went back to Liverpool and got quite a few bookings, you know, they all thought we were German. You know, we had builders from Hamburg and they all said, you speak good English, you know, things like that. So we went back to Germany, we had a bit more money the second time. So we bought leather pants and we looked like four Jean Vincents, only a bit younger, I think. And that was it, you know, and we just kept those, the leather gear, till Brian came along. It was a bit sort of old hat anyway, all wearing leather gear. And we decided we didn't want to look sort of ridiculous, just going on because it, more often than not, sort of people, too many people would laugh. It was just stupid, we didn't want to appear as a gang of idiots and Brian suggested that we just sort of wore ordinary suits so we just got what we thought were quite good suits and just got rid of the leather gear that was all so the idea was pinched anyway oh yeah I had my pants I pinched anyway we didn't laugh at them in Liverpool we do like the fans and enjoy reading the publicity about us but from time to time you don't realise that it's actually about yourself you see your pictures and read articles about you know, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Paul and John. Uh, but you don't actually think, oh, that's me, that I am in the paper. It's, it's funny, it's just as though it's a different person. When we go home, you know, it's, we go in early in the morning when we finish the job and the kids, you know, they don't know you at home. But if they find out well, where I live, they get the drums out, you know, and beat it out, because it's a play street. and. You know, there's no traffic or nothing bothering them. And once, when the boys came for me, they popped in to see me, mum and my dad, you know. We had to go out the back, because, you know, there's 20 or 30 outside. And they wouldn't believe me, mother, you know, they'd knock in saying, can we have the autographs? So, 
it built up, you know, so much. There was about 200 kids all around the door, and there was peeping through the window and knocking, you know. In the end, my mother was ill, you know. She said, you out of her life, just all these kids and boys and girls, and that, you know. They said there was a lot of jelly babies and chocolates and things like that, because just because um, somebody wrote in one of the papers uh, about presents and things that we had given to us, and John said he got some jelly babies, and I ate them. But ever since that, we've been inundated. We had about two tonne a night. But the, um, the main trouble is they, they tend to throw them at us <laughs> when we're on stage. And uh, once I got one in my eye, which wasn't very nice. In fact, I've never been the same thing. <laughs> Girls aren't complaining, you know, we're not. We're just putting the point is that, you know, it affects your home more than it does yourself, you know, because you know what to expect for your parents and your family, you know. The Beatles' debut single was released on the 5th of October in 1962. Love Me Do reached number 17 in the charts, which was a strong showing for a band's first release. Although they re-recorded the single with session drummer Andy White on September 11th, initial copies of the single carried the recording of Love Me Do from their early September 4th session. When EMI came to release the 1963 EP The Beatles Hits, it was decided that the version featuring White was the best, and the master recording featuring Ringo's drumming was destroyed. Sales of Love Me Do slash P.S. I Love You were strongest in the Liverpool area. There were strong rumors that Brian Epstein bought 10,000 copies of the single to improve its chart ranking. While quite possibly true, these were never proven to be true. Four days later, they had no publicity or live engagements, but chose to visit London journalists. They first visited the offices of Record Mirror, where they attempted to encourage the editorial team to feature the single. This was followed by a visit to Alan Smith, a Liverpudlian journalist on the New Musical Express. Smith asked the Beatles what they thought of Londoners, and he received the reply, not much. If they know you come from the North, they don't want to know. Attitudes would swiftly change once the Beatles found nationwide success. At 8.45 p.m. on Saturday the 27th, before their fourth and final live appearance at the Home Hall in Birkenhead, the Beatles recorded a radio interview for Radio Clatterbridge. It is the group's earliest surviving recorded interview. The station served two local hospitals, Cleaver and Clatterbridge. The Beatles were interviewed by Monty Lister with additional questions from Malcolm Threadgill and Peter Smethurst. Lister presented two shows on the Radio Clatterbridge, Music with Monty and Sunday Spin. The Beatles had little experience to draw from. Just three weeks had passed since the release of Love Me Do, and much of the interview was spent establishing basic information about the group. John Lennon spoke of working on Please Please Me in the hope that it would become their second single, and Paul McCartney notably described Lennon as the Beatles' leader. On the 30th of October, the Beatles flew from Liverpool to Hamburg, on this day ahead of their second residency at Hamburg's Star Club, situated on Groy Freiheit off the Raperbahn. They were contracted to play for 14 consecutive nights at the venue, from the 1st to the 14th of November in 1962. Although they didn't know it at the time, by the end of the year their lives would be turned upside down. They would be famous all across the United Kingdom, and elsewhere, and their singles and albums would have sold into the millions. It was in this tiny council house, number 174 Mackets Lane, that the youngest member of the Beatles, George Harrison, lived. His father was a bus driver, and the family lived here until 1965, when the pressure of fame forced them to move to a house in nearby Warrington that George bought for his father. In stark contrast to the relative prosperity of the areas where John, Paul, and George grew up, Richard Starkey, Ringo Starr, was born here in the working class heart of Liverpool, the Dingle, at number nine Madryn Street. This house that heard Ringo Starr's first newborn cries is now derelict. The windows boarded up. Even the original door is gone and they've replaced it with a second hand door. Ringo lived here for six years until his mother, to take advantage of lower rents, swapped this house with a friend and moved across the way to Admiral Grove. 
Has the ringo suggested you should stop work as a Liverpool Corporation painter? He certainly has, but I don't want to move. I like my job and I like the people I work with. They've been really wonderful to me. Has Ringo's affluence made any difference to you at all? No, not in a way. I'm, I'm happy for him, like, that uh, what he's doing, like, he's got security for the rest of his life. And we're quite happy about it, the wife and I. Mrs. Gravestock, does Ringo want to move house? I don't really think so. He's asked us to have another house, but we're quite happy. And the neighbours and everybody's very good and proud that the boys have got to where they are. Will the neighbours not become envious of all the wealth that's been accumulated by the Beatles? No, not the neighbours around here. They're all very good and all quite proud. Ringo lived here at number 10 Admiral Grove from the age of six until he found fame and fortune with the Beatles. The pub on the corner, The Empress, appeared on the album cover of his first solo album, Sentimental Journeys. And Ringo's stepfather and his mother clung on to this house until the fan power pushed them out. Friday, January 11th, the Beatles' second single was their first to reach number one. That is according to some charts. Back in the day, there was no official single source for chart placings. On some, including New Musical Express and Melody Maker, Please Please Me made the top spot. In others, it only managed number two. Regardless of the true chart placing, the release of Please Please Me had a key effect on the Beatles' career. It put them firmly in the big league. Although Beatlemania was still some ways away, it established them as a household name and ensured they would record a long player for EMI. On Monday, February 11th, the Beatles recorded 10 songs for their debut album, Please Please Me, at EMI's Abbey Road Studios in London. Three sessions took place during the day, with the recording finishing at 10.45 p.m. Only two had originally been scheduled, but the third was added later on. On Friday, March 22nd, the Beatles' album Please Please Me is released. The disc went on to overtake all rivals when it bounced into the coveted number one slot. By April 5th, the Beatles received their first silver disc. On April 8th, Julian Lennon is born. However, the Beatles' heavy work schedule meant that John Lennon was unable to see his wife and son until Thursday, April 11th. Saturday, May 18th, the Beatles tour with Roy Orbison. On May 27th, the Beatles' first concert in Cardiff, Wales, took place during their UK tour with Roy Orbison. They performed at the city's Capitol Cinema. Also on the bill, in order of appearance, were the Terry Young Six, Ian Crawford, Louis Cordette, David Macbeth, Jerry and the Pacemakers, comedian Erky Grant, and Roy Orbison. The Beatles were the headline act and were paid 100 pounds for their appearance. They performed a seven song set. Some other guy, do you want to know a secret? Love me do, from me to you, please please me. I saw her standing there and twist and shout. With the success of the Beatles looking assured, and expectations for better things as their fame grew across the United Kingdom, Brian Epstein formed the Beatles Limited to handle their legal and business affairs on the 20th of June. Although much of their business continued to be handled by NEMS Enterprises, the new company was a partnership which allowed each of the Beatles to have a specified stake in their success and to ensure lower rates of corporate tax. The Beatles LTD was replaced in April 1967 with the formation of the Beatles and Company, which was later to become Apple Corps. On July 1st, the Beatles recorded both sides of their fourth UK single, She Loves You, I'll Get You, which was released on the 23rd of August in 1963. The group began recording at 5 p.m. at Abbey Road Studio 2 and finished at 10 p.m., although the session had been booked for 2.30 to 5.30 p.m. The two songs worked on were She Loves You and I'll Get You, the latter under its working title, Get You in the End. Also in July, the Beatles completed, in under eight hours, 18 songs for three editions of the radio show Pop Go the Beatles. At the BBC Paris studio in London, they rehearsed and recorded the songs along with Between the Song Banter. The shows were broadcast on the BBC Light program on the 6th, the 13th, and the 20th of August in 1963. These were later released as the BBC Sessions. On the 30th of July, the Beatles recorded Money, Till There Was You, 
Roll over Beethoven. It won't be long and all my loving. This was the Beatles' second EMI session of the day. The first had ended so the group could record an interview and radio session for the BBC. The evening session began at 5 p.m. and finished at 11 p.m., an hour later than scheduled. On Saturday, the 3rd of August, after nearly 300 performances at Liverpool's Cavern Club, this was the Beatles' final show at the venue. It was well known that the Beatles had outgrown the Cavern by this time, and their regular fans were grudgingly aware that their popularity could only be served by bigger venues. <laughs> this is where it all began. And for me, this is where the century is going to end with me playing rock and roll, which if you remember the Beatles before the Beatles was a fabulous little rock and roll band. That was what held us together for so long and made us so good, I think, he said modestly. But um, I'm back here because I love Liverpool. No more fantastic place to rock out the century. Thank you very much for coming. God bless everybody. If there was any doubt that the Beatles were a bona fide UK phenomenon by August 1963, the release of their fourth single went beyond all expectations. The songs were recorded on the 1st of July in 1963. She Loves You, with its B-side I'll Get You, was the Beatles' first single to sell more than a million copies in Britain. The single entered the charts on the 31st of August and remained there for 31 consecutive weeks. It reached number one on the 14th of September, remained there for a month, and returned on the 30th of November. The Beatles had rare days off, but on the 9th and 10th of September in 1963, John Lennon and Paul McCartney did have one engagement. They attended a luncheon of the Variety Club of Great Britain. The luncheon took place at the Savoy Hotel in London. Lennon and McCartney received the award for Top Vocal Group of the Year a sure sign that the Beatles were rapidly becoming establishment figures. The Variety Club was the UK branch of Variety, the children's charity, which raises money for disadvantaged children. It has had strong links with the world of show business. I think somebody got to say a word. It's, it's very nice indeed to get, especially to get one each, because we usually have a bit of trouble cutting them in four. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you very much. It's a great honor. Thank you. Now, Paul. Uh, same goes for me. Thank you very much for giving us this silver heart. But I still think you should, you should have given one to good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> um, hang on. Anyone who knows us knows I'm the one that never speaks, so I'd just like to say thanks a lot. <laughs> i just like to say the same as the others. Thanks for the Purple Hearts. <laughs> silver! Silver! Oh, yeah. Sorry about that, I was We'd like to sincerely thank you all, and uh, we've got to go now, because the fella on the film wants us, and he says it's costing him a fortune. <laughs> thank you! The group did not slow down. On October 1st, they recorded I Want to Be Your Man and Little Child. On October the 4th, the Beatles performed three songs during their first of three appearances on Ready, Steady, Go. The Beatles mimed Twist and Shout, I'll Get You, and She Loves You, and were interviewed by Dusty Springfield. The episode was transmitted from 6.15 p.m. to 7 p.m. Although the Beatles' popularity had been growing steadily and to increasingly frantic heights through 1963, their appearance at the London Palladium on Sunday the 13th of October catapulted them into the attentions of the mainstream media, who coined the term Beatlemania to describe the scenes of screaming fans. The Beatles' third UK EP was a collection of four songs taken from their debut album Please Please Me. It was released, like all the group's UK output so far, on the EMI subsidiary label Parlophone. Monday, November 4th was the night the Beatles appeared at the Royal Command performance at the Prince of Wales Theatre in London in the presence of the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. By this point, Beatlemania was an established phenomenon, with the group drawing large, huge, and frenzied audiences across the country and beyond. This was followed by numerous TV appearances over the next few months, and beyond now they have become the world's number one pop group. The Beatles' fifth UK single was an instant smash, with pre-orders of more than a million copies. 
The Beatles ended 1963 and started 1964 with their Christmas show. Starting from December 24th and going through to January 11th, the Beatles made their debut on the television show Val Parnell's Sunday Night at the London Palladium on the 13th of October in 1963. Three months later, they made their return on January 12th. The difference in the Beatles' profile between then and now was huge, illustrated not least by their fee having gone from 250 pounds to 1,000 pounds. Following their first night of performances at the Olympia Theatre in Paris, the Beatles on January 16th arrived back at the Hotel George V, where they were told that I Want to Hold Your Hand had reached number one in America. Meet the Beatles, the band's first LP on Capitol Records, was released in America on the 20th of January in 1964. It came out while the Beatles were in Paris. Please Please Me had first been released as a single in America on the 25th of February in 1963, but had failed to make an impact. The cash-in on the success of I Want to Hold Your Hand, and in anticipation of the Beatles' first U.S. visit, VJ re-released the single. On the 7th of February, 1964, the Beatles' American Invasion began. The band's Boeing 707, Pan Am Flight 101, left London Airport, early bound for New York City. Any doubts about the Beatles' reception in America were dispelled the moment they touched out. New Yorkers turned out in force, and making allowance for an American accent, the screams might have been genuine Merseyside. George, John, Paul and Ringo had found a new world to conquer. Some press conference. For half an hour, there was so much din you couldn't tell a word. It was a matter of everybody being patient, hoping it would begin eventually. Anyway, we rose up. No! <laughs> Sorry. Next question. <laughs> no, we need money first. <laughs> How much money do you expect to take out of this country? Nothing. Half a crown, $10. Sorry, I... Knowing well, they can tell us what they think they have. How many are bald that you have to wear those big? Don't all of us. I'm bald. You're bald? Oh, we're all bald. Don't yeah. tell anyone, please. I'm <laughs> deaf and dumb, too. I'm deaf and dumb, too. Now you can get a quarter Aren't you afraid of what the American Barbers Association is going to think of you? Well, we've run quicker than the English ones. We'll have a go in. <laughs> Did you hope to get a haircut at all? No. Nope. No. No. Thanks. I had one yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no lie. It's true. <laughs> no, I think he missed. No. No, he didn't. No. You should have seen him the day before. The crowds had waited outside to cheer them all the way to the hotel. No arguing about it. The Beatles are the top pop music phenomenon of the century. The 9th of February, 1964, was the date that the Beatles' record-breaking first live appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show took place at Studio 50 in New York City. 73 million people were reported to have watched the first show. It is still supposed to be one of the largest viewing audiences ever in the U.S. When they arrived in America, and how come 73 million people were watching for an unknown band? No, what had happened was that the Beatles had started to have their success a little earlier. It was in late November 1963 that there was a TV news report that came to America that was going to be shown. Unfortunately, that evening was Friday, November 22nd, which is the day JFK was shot. So, and uh, after that tragedy, they took the film clip of the Beatles and put it on the, on, on the shelf. Thought, well, we can't show this now. 18 days later, Later, Walter Cronkite said he was trying to cheer up the American nation after this tragedy. He said, hang on, didn't we have something light-hearted we can show to people? Yeah, we got that clip of those weird guys from England with the funny hair. Why don't we put that on? It'll cheer people up. And that is why three weeks later when they land here, there's already Beatlemania. What did you most like about the trip, Ringo? Oh, I just loved all of it, you know, especially yeah. Miami. The yeah. sun, you know. 
I didn't know what it meant until I went over there. <laughs> Don't you get it up in Liverpool? No, they they finished up there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out. Did you ever have a chance, John, to just get away on your own without yeah. anybody recognising you? We borrowed a couple of millionaires' houses, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well we well, did. You could afford to buy a couple of millionaires' houses, couldn't you? No, John, yeah, no, yeah. We'd sooner borrow them; it's cheaper. <laughs> and we did a bit of water skiing. <laughs> uh, well, sort of. Anyway. Yeah, we had a great time. Did you? Did your wife enjoy it over there? Yeah, uh, she loved it. Who? <laughs> who? Who? <laughs> Don't tell him he's married. It's a secret. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to. What about the uh, taste of the fans over there? Did you find the same stuff? She never bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the, uh, we expected them to be very different, but but they weren't at all. Yeah. <laughs> the accent was the only thing, you know, it was the only difference. Oh, Lovely. Did they reckon, did they reckon you sang in, a, in, a, in an English accent or American No, some fella said, how come, because you're from Britain and you still sing an American accent or something. Yeah. Yeah. So funny. Then, We've been trying to explain him to him that it's a Liverpool American, accent. You know, yeah. believe he kept it. Oh, it's funny. We when, like when you came back from France, you told me that they liked the sort of quicker numbers. Yeah. And But what did you do? Did you just do all the same routine as you do here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, because yeah, we did the, the, the records were a hit over there. Mm. Oh, the ones that hit oh yeah, we had to do Please Please Me over there. Yeah. We haven't been doing that for a long time yeah. here, but it's in the charts. That's history here. Yeah. 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 What about the the Beatles styles, all these wigs and suits and things? Are they catching on over there? Yeah, they're selling they're well. Selling <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, I, hear, I hear anyway that the four of you are going to be millionaires by the end of the year. Oh, oh that's, yeah. that's nice. Have you, have you got time? <laughs> <laughs> Have you, got time to, have you got time to actually spend this money? What money? <laughs> <laughs> he said. Doesn't he give any to you? No, no. no. Have you seen that car of his? One of the things you did was visit Clay. What? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, one of the things you did was visit Cla on Cassius me. Clay. He's <laughs> a big lad. Who's going to win? Clay Liston. Ringo. Ringo. I'll win him. Okay. <laughs> but well, it, it all depends, you see. If you go to his gym, you have to say he wins. And if you go to Liston's gym, you say Liston will win. Yeah. The big lad's in. Jim will win. I big think monsters. Liston will win, but yeah, Cassius Clay is yeah, a good Liston. singer. He's a good singer. He's but he told lad. us, yeah, he's, he's should be Checker's cousin. He made up a poem as well. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, one, of the, one of the things that have been reported over here in the British Embassy, what actually happened in Washington at this place? Well, we just sort of went... Excuse me. Cut. We just... <laughs> we just went up to this sort of uh, embassy party given by this... given by this Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the British Ambassador. Oh, yeah. He was a Lord, isn't he? Lord. Oh, Lord. Well, <laughs> and, and we went up to his house, and there was a, uh, it was a bit hectic, you know, and we judged the bingo or something. <laughs> but what about this business of somebody coming up and cutting your hair? Oh, it was him. Oh, it's your hair. How about it? Girl, who? What about? At the back, can you see? Look how short it is now. It's a terrible loss. I know. Oh, my God. Were you really short? Short? No, no. I just looked down, and you just saw all the faces. <laughs> On Monday, the 2nd of March, 1964, the Beatles joined Equity, the Actors' Union. Only minutes before they began shooting their first film, the as yet untitled A Hard Day's Night. Their union memberships were proposed and seconded by Wilfred Brambell and Norman Rosington, their main co-stars in the film. A movie which also starred Victor Spinetti, who would later appear in every Beatles film there afterwards. Friday, March 20th, in between filming Hard Day's Night, was the second of three performances given by the Beatles for the hugely popular 1960s television show, Ready, Steady, Go. Saturday, March 28th, London Waxworks Museum Madame Tussaud unveiled life-size figures of all four Beatles. They were the first pop group to be immortalized in the museum. April 10th saw the follow-up to the Meet the Beatles. The Beatles' second album was their third long player in the United States, if introducing the Beatles, released by VJ in January 1964, is included. The Capitol album contains songs from four different UK releases, with the Beatles, Thank You Girl from the From Me to You single, both sides of She Loves You slash I'll Get You, and You Can't Do That from the Can't Buy Me Love single. Two new songs, Long Tall Sally and I Call Your Name, were also included. More than 1,000 fans were waiting for the Beatles at Hong Kong's Kai Tak Airport when they arrived on the 8th of June. They were allowed to bypass customs and immigration procedures and were swiftly taken to the President Hotel in Kowloon, where they were booked to stay on the 15th floor. 
Then on June 11th, the Beatles flew from Hong Kong to Sydney, stopping en route in Darwin to allow their airplane to refuel. Although it was an unscheduled stop, 400 fans were waiting as they landed in Darwin at 2.35 a.m. July 4th saw the world premiere of A Hard Day's Night. The premiere was attended by the Beatles and their wives and girlfriends, and a host of important guests, including Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden. Nearby, Piccadilly Circus was closed to traffic, as 12,000 fans jostled for a glimpse of the group. Piccadilly Circus, the yep. heart of London. Yes. Here we have the London Pavilion, which is now a shopping arcade, but I believe in the 60s it was a cinema. That's right, and in fact it was the place where the Beatles had the premieres of their films A Hard Day's Night, Help, and in 1968, Yellow Submarine. And all of them were Royal World Charity Gala premieres. That was the status of the Beatles in the 60s. And on all three occasions for their premieres, the traffic in Piccadilly Circus was brought to an absolute standstill. Thousands of people mobbing the streets. And, uh, you know, just amazing occasions every time. And it showed their pulling power even through to the end of the decade that they could mob the streets like that just by turning up together. I was doing a show in London called Old Lovely War, musical, um, at Wyndham's Theatre. And they came to see it, and uh, John particularly saw the show, and he said, hey, Vicky, got to be in our film. Right. And that was it, and I met the producer and the director, and I was in Hard Day's Night. And of course, I was a fan, you see. And suddenly when they turned up, and I loved the music, and suddenly when they turned up, it was absolutely sensational. When I first walked on the set, I was playing a television director in uh, in Hard Day's Night, mm -hmm. and as I walked on the set um, to start the to start the before we started shooting, we started to talk, and it was as if we'd known each other all our lives. It was the most extraordinary thing. I think it's because they came from Liverpool, mm. and I came from South Wales. That those kind of backgrounds that we sort of hit it off straight away, and we, we just started talking, and well, we haven't really stopped. How did it uh, compare when you met them there, uh, you know, as they were as people, to what their public image was, and were you surprised? Or? Well, the most extraordinary thing about them was they were really, truly extraordinary because they were really, truly ordinary. Now, what I mean by that is, to be truly ordinary is marvellous. They were truly ordinary because they had no um, hang-ups. They, they didn't have any attitudes. They didn't have any chips on their, uh, on their shoulders, they were just there. And in the middle of uh, what one, you could call a kind of, well, in the hurricane of beating mania, mm. there was a still small center. In the middle of it, these four lads sat talking and they used to say to me, what did you talk about on the set of those films? And I said, well, we'd be sitting behind this bit of white stuff out there on Hard Day's Night particularly, there'd be all these fans screaming. And we'd be sitting in there talking and we'd talk about, uh, the Freudian interpretation of dreams as opposed to the Jungian interpretation of dreams. They were talking about what dreams meant or they would they'd say things like, um, John would say, I wonder did Beethoven ever write any music for himself rather than for his patron? Uh, they used to talk about things like, uh, well, have laughs as well and jokes, but really straight into fascinating conversations and when I used to say to people they, they used to say the Beatles talked about Freud because you see at that time you must remember that the world's changed a lot then um, pop stars so-called or the Fab Four so-called people outside thought they were dim-witted idiots mm. not uh, anything but and when uh, when they wanted to dis discover something John was very hungry about reading about things uh, let's go somewhere let's go to the theatre let's go they wanted to know about things. They were, they were people who were really hungry for information. What kind of things was he, was he reading around that time? Well, John, at that, well, at that time, yeah. particularly, yeah. he was yeah. actually reading uh, the Jungian interpretation of dreams mm. as opposed to what Freud said. It was, it was, I mean, it sounds heavy, but it really wasn't. It was great fun. And he, he'd love to talk about things like, uh, uh, well, if you like, cybernetics. He was talking about... Uh, about computers and what they would do, what they think they could do. I mean, then, when they were just, when it had just started, it were really great conversation, great fun. And also, I mean, in, there'd be all sorts of jokes inside. I remember I was in a car with them once and 
It was jammed. You couldn't get out of the car. The fans were all around it. They were pushing and screaming against the car. And we didn't know what to do. We were sitting in it. And John said, just turn around and said, push Paul out first. He's the prettiest. <laughs> I mean, the laugh, the, the laughs they had in the middle of it. But you see, because they were a still small center and they were four ordinary lads. And by that, I mean truly extraordinary mm. by being really basic that they kept themselves sane. This was followed on July 10th with both the Hard Day's Night single and album. It entered the UK charts on the 18th of July and a week later knocked the Rolling Stones' It's All Over Now from the number one spot. It remained there for three weeks and spent a further nine weeks in the charts. The A Hard Day's Night album had advance orders of over 250,000. It hit number one on the 25th of July, 1964, where it remained for an astonishing 21 consecutive weeks. In all, it spent 38 weeks in the UK charts, and by the end of 1964, it had sold more than 600,000 copies. Behind me is Coco, the new trendy name for what used to be the Camden Palace which in the 70s was one of London's greatest and most well-known rock venues. In the 60s, in fact from 1957 onwards, it was actually a BBC live soundstage, which means everybody that did a BBC session or recording from the goons onwards would have used that stage in there. And that includes the Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles, the Fab Four, would have been inside what is now Coco. Take a look at that building. Behind me is Palladium House. It's just lower down than the Palladium, just off Oxford Street in central London. It was from 1965 Brian Epstein's management office. Had Brian lived, he was going to go into business partnership with Robert Stigwood. Imagine what a team that would have created. The Beatles and the Bee Gees all on one management roster. Doesn't sound too bad to me. They were, had Brian lived, also going to manage a young black artist. He was known as Jimi Hendrix. Who knows what would have happened? Palladium House was Brian Epstein's office. It's right here in central London. Behind me is the Bag and Elms pub. In fact, just around the corner in that direction is Buckingham Palace, which is kind of fitting because in the 1960s, the London press dubbed this pub, the Bag and Elms, Buckingham Palace Mark II. You want to know why? Dead simple. In the upstairs room was the drinking place of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who, and just about every major 60s band that ever passed through central London. That was where they did all the drinking. That was nicknamed Buckingham Palace Mark II, and that is the Bag of Nails. Carnaby Street in London. It was once said that if aliens came back and visited right now, they'd wonder where the hell they'd arrived at. In the 60s and the 70s, it was the coolest place in the world. If you wanted that t-shirt you'd spend all your life looking for, it was here. If you wanted that jacket that like just stepped off the cover of Sergeant Pepper, you came down to Carnaby Street, the mod capital of the world in the 1960s. The Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, when they were here in 1967, Jimi Hendrix, the Beatles, they all shopped here, they all bought their clothing here. John Lennon once said, if you couldn't find one on Carnaby Street, there's a possibility that one had never been made. This is Carnaby Street. It's still not today, it's really hip. In August, the Beatles continued to tour America, finishing off the Paramount Theater in New York on Sunday, September 20th. October sees the Beatles recording more tracks. Eight days a week, Kansas City slash Hey 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 Hey, Mr. Moonlight, I Feel Fine, I'll Follow the Sun, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, Rock and Roll Music, and Words of Love. November 30th, Brian Epstein appears on the long-running BBC radio series Desert Island Discs. His choice of music was George Martin Orchestra, All My Loving, Johann Sebastian Bach, Bradenburg Concerto No. 5 in D Major, Quartet Tres Bian, Kilman Jarl, The Beatles, She's a Woman, Jean Sibelis, Symphony No. 2 in D Major, Michael Olatenji, Odundi Odundi, Happy New Year, Max Bruch, Violin Concerto No. 1 in D Minor, Carmen Amaya and Company, Fiesta de Juarez, December 1st, Ringo Starr begins a 10-day stay at University College Hospital in London. He was booked in to have his tonsils removed, an operation that took place the following day. December 4th saw the release of the Beatles' fourth Parlophone slash EMI album, Beatles for Sale, which contains a mix of Lennon, McCartney originals, and cover versions. 
Because their schedules were so busy by the later half of 1964, the Beatles resorted to recording several Cavern Club era songs. I'll Follow the Sun was written by Paul McCartney in 1959 and dusted down when it looked like they may be lacking suitable material. December 15th saw the release of Beatles 65, the Beatles' fifth album on Capitol Records, included the majority of songs from Beatles for Sale, and added I'll Be Back, She's a Woman, and I Feel Fine. Of the Beatles for Sale songs, it left out Eight Days a Week, Words of Love, Every Little Thing, I Don't Want to Spoil the Party, What You're Doing, and Kansas City slash Hey 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 Hey. Those songs were included on the June 1965 album Beatles 6. December 24th, the Beatles start another Beatles Christmas show. Following the success of the Beatles Christmas show in December 1963 and early 1964, Brian Epstein decided that the group should repeat the trick, this time at the Hammersmith Odeon in London. The formula was much the same as the previous years, with music, pantomime sketches, comedy, and several special guests. These included Freddie and the Dreamers, Sounds Incorporated, Elkie Brooks, the Yardbirds, Michael Haslam, the Mike Cotton Sound, and Ray Fell. The comp here was Jimmy Seville. So Richard, this is the London Apollo, but it didn't always look like this, did it? No, nope. back in 1964, Christmas of 1964, you would have seen the letters, the Beatles Christmas Show, right across the front. It was a package show that they did for their fans, comedy and music. And in those days, this was, of course, the Hammersmith Odeon. And then in Christmas of 65, they did another Beatles Christmas Show. Didn't repeat it in 66. Uh, a bottle or two, a yes. couple of bottles, <laughs> packets of ciggies. How about uh, a special message from George? Yeah, a very merry happy Christmas and send me Jackie back, it's uh, cold. Uh, John. Uh, Gary Crimble and Manny Rudolph. Ringo. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, see you soon. Paul. Uh, lots of luck and uh, many presents and uh, happy Crimble, that's uh, all I think. With a song for Christmas. How about okay. that? Uh, Gary Crimble to you. Gary Crimble to you. Gary Crimble, dear yeah. Rudolph. Gary Crimble, me too. Two dogs, the rain, no rain, yeah. Had a very shiny nose. And when he shined, he died. Happy Christmas, all the best. Thank you. Happy Christmas. But the main reason that we're here really is not so much for what they did during the Christmas shows, but for an interesting little artifact around the back of the building. So Richard, this wrought iron staircase behind the theatre looms large in the Beatles legend. Absolutely. 1964, the film A Hard Day's Night, and there's a segment where the Beatles come rushing out of here, Ringo comes out of this door and says, we're out. They've just escaped the pressures of filming a TV show. And they come running down this wrought iron staircase and to the uh, song Can't Buy Me Love. And it's like in fast motion, you see them all running down the staircase and running out. I remember, and they rush off into this field here. Uh, there is no field here. There never was. It's just a parking lot, but basically it was spliced together in the film almost seamlessly. February 1st, 1965, Capitol Records released their second and final Beatles EP, 4x4 Four Four, The Beatles. The EP contained four songs, all from the albums Beatles for Sale and Beatles 65, Honey Don't, I'm a Loser, Mr. Moonlight, and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. February 23rd, the Beatles began filming their second feature film, Help. March 22nd saw the release of the early Beatles album. Capitol Records were still keen to wring as much money as possible out of Beatles fans in America, leading to the release of the early Beatles in 1965 of March. It contained 11 songs from Please Please Me. I saw her standing there, Misery and There's a Place were omitted. The 11th of May in 1965 was the group's final day of work on the film Help. A shooting had begun in the Bahamas on the 23rd of February in 1965, and the group totaled 54 days of work until this day. Several scenes in London were also filmed by director Richard Lester on the following day, May the 12th, but these did not feature the Beatles. The Beatles' U.S. label, Capitol Records, released the album Beatles 6 on the 14th of June in 1965. It was the group's sixth LP release by the label, not counting the Beatles' story documentary. VJ and United Artists Records had each released an album too, meaning that Beatles 6 was the group's ninth album to be released stateside. As with all their releases up to 1966, the Beatles had little say in the contents of the album. It did, however, contain two songs recorded especially for North American listeners. 
covers of Larry Williams' Bad Boy and Dizzy Miss Lizzie, both of which were taped at Abbey Road on the 10th of May in 1965. 